No, no, we're fine, we're just... Now where's that come from? Hmm. Pull it out. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the worship at the East Church. Welcome to our communion service today. It's a bit different. Uh, you'll have little pots in front of you, so when we come to the communion at the end of the service, thank you very much, Margaret and Andy, for laying it all out for us. You'll have a little pot with bread in and a little pot with wine in. And there, there will be two elders joining me at the, the table here. And what we'll be doing is we'll be taking communion together. So I mean, I'll break the bread, as I normally do, and then I'll invite us all to eat the bread together. And then we'll all drink the cup together. Hopefully that'll uh, be a, a different kind of communion, but uh, just as enjoyable as normal. So welcome if you're here in church. Welcome if you're here in church. As usual, let's just turn around and give everybody a wave. I'm going to wave to Muriel. It's great, great to have Muriel back with us. I know, I know, I'm, I'm trying not to. <laughs> this week, it's a little bit, uh, we're in a kind of transition between completely relying on videos to having live music with Muriel. So this week we will be singing still mainly to videos and Muriel will be playing through the service. Next week we'll be going to a service where we sing along to Muriel's playing uh, for each one of the hymns. <laughs> well, well done Muriel, we're happy to have you back. <laughs> so welcome here to the East Church. Welcome as well if you're watching on, on the live streams on, on Facebook or YouTube or you're watching on the recordings on the website. It's great that we can gather in so many different ways. So next week, yes, I've told, told you about next week, where we'll be singing uh, properly with, with Muriel playing, playing the compliments. At this point, yes, we've just given Muriel a round of applause, that's great, but while we will still be uh, recording, we'll still be streaming live, maybe not every week, I want just to put on record a great thank you to so many people who have actually grasped the requirements of producing lockdown um, services and have been on a very steep kind of leaning curve on how all this works. There's lots and lots of you, so I'm not going to name you all, all the jobs that, you, that you've done, but I'm just so thankful for help, not just on a Sunday, but with the weekly preparations and the extra little videos that have been put on Facebook and such like. So thank you for everyone who's helped out and thank you for everyone who's come back into the church since we opened originally on, in September 2020. It's been great, but it's great to have worked out these new ways of worshiping as well. And it's been quite a day or a weekend in the manse this week as well, because in the manse over the last few weeks we've been nursing a rather poorly mandarin orange bush. And this week it achieved a major milestone, it really did. After a prune and a spray and a little gentle loosening of the roots and a check on the drainage of the soil, it's been basking in the warm glass entrance porch to the uh, manse for a few weeks. Now these plants, they love temperatures above 10 degrees C, but it's got too hot for it in the man's, uh, at the uh, uh, entrance of the man's, because the plants also like quite a humid atmosphere. So the big thing for that plant was that this weekend, it went out through the back door and is just sitting on the back step. And it's been amazing to see the change in just a couple of days as it had the wind kind of ruffling its leaves and, and, and the conditions that it really liked. It comes back in at night because I still don't trust the nighttime temperatures. And when I thought about that, it kind of summarizes the book of Revelation that we're working through at the moment, doesn't it? If you replace orange bush with people of the church, there you have it. It's an outline of how, of how to live to look at what you're doing, what you've done, to review it and work out what story, what you need to do going forward. The outline of how to live with God, with God's view of life each day and it focuses you on the hope of eternal life that God holds out to each one of us. So as we gather, we gather with hope 
Remember the phrase that we hear repeated seven times to the seven churches of Asia in the book of Revelation. The good advice John writes down for us, the news he got from an angel who heard it from Jesus, who was just telling it as God sees it in the book of Revelation. So let anyone who has an ear listen to what the Spirit is saying to you, and I will give you permission to eat from the tree of life. What a marvellous hope. What a marvellous sentence of reassurance. So let us worship God. Let us pray. Eternal loving God, your great name we praise. For you are fountains of goodness and love. You gave us life, and yet you take a detailed interest in all that we do. So today we come to you, our Lord, for it is you who will heal us. You, our Lord, will bind us up. So we lay before you now the ways in which we have wounded your love. May the Lord heal us and forgive us. May the Lord reconcile us to one another and to him. May the Lord send us out in love. So let's take a few moments of quietness to lay our thoughts about our lives this week in front of God. Let him whisper to us our needs for the future. Lord, in the great scale of things we are small, and it's your love that makes us great. We are far away, Lord, and your love brings us near. We are hungry for healing, Lord, and your love fills our needs. Raise us to the new life, Lord, that you offer, the eternal life, assured for us through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Saviour, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. So our Bible reading this morning is taken from the book of Revelations, chapter 1, verses 9 to 20, and then in chapter 2, verses 1 to 7. Listen for the word of God. I, John, your brother, who share with you in Jesus the persecution and the kingdom and the patient endurance, was on the island called Patmos because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard behind me a loud voice, like a trumpet, saying, Write in a book what you see and send it to the seven churches to Ephesus, to Smyrna, to Pergamum, to Thyatira, to Sardis, to Philadelphia, and to Laodicea. Then I turned to see whose voice it was that spoke to me, and on turning I saw seven golden lampstands, and in the midst of the lampstands I saw one like the Son of Man, clothed with a long robe and with a golden sash across his chest. His head and his hair were white, as white as wool, white as snow, his eyes were like a flame of fire. His feet were like burnished bronze, refined as in a furnace. And his voice was like the sound of many waters. In his right hand he held seven stars, and from his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword. And his face was like the sun shining with full force. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. But he placed his right hand on me, saying, Do not be afraid, I am the first and the last, and the living one. I was dead, and see, I am alive forever and ever. And I have the keys of death and of Hades. Now write what you have seen, what it is and what it is to take place after this. As for the mystery of the seven stars, that you saw in my right hand. And the seven golden lamp stands the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. Revelations 2, 1 to 7. To the angel of the church in Ephesus write, These are the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks among the seven golden lampstands. 
I know your works, your toil and your patient endurance. I know that you cannot tolerate evildoers. You have tested those who claim to be apostles but are not, and you found them to be fake, to false. I also know that you are enduring patiently and bearing up for the sake of my name, and that you have not grown weary. But I have this against you, that you have abandoned that love you had at first. Remember then from what you have fallen. Repent and do the works you did at first. If not, I will come to you and remove your lamp stand from its place, unless you repent. Yet this is to your credit. You hate the works of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Let anyone who has an ear listen to what the Spirit is saying to the churches. To everyone who conquers, I will give permission to eat from the tree of life that is in the paradise of God. Oops, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen. Good morning, everyone, <clears throat> and welcome here today. I hope you all enjoyed last week's introduction to Revelation and that you can see that this complicated book actually has a structure and it's not as complicated as we think. So this morning I'm going to look at our first part of the reading and it's basically just an introduction to the letters to the seven churches. So we begin here with John. He introduces himself very quickly, very simply, with a short explanation of why he's here. He's in Patmos due to his belief and his preaching of Jesus. He was in the spirit. This is a dreamlike trance brought by an angel that God had sent him. He hears behind him a loud voice like a trumpet. Now this is significant in that the trumpet usually announces the coming of God. But this time it's announcing the heavenly son, the heavenly son of man. This time it's Jesus. So John uses the same description for Jesus as he does for God. He sees their significant entry as equal. The voice come from behind him and he had to turn around to see who it was. Seeing is not automatic. You don't automatically see Jesus. You must search for him in your journey. You must turn around. And all of this took place on the Lord's Day, the first day of the week, which of course we know is Sunday. This is the day of worship, a day in which John separated from his friends and companions, was able to come together because they too will be worshiping on the Lord's Day. So on this Sunday, John is in spirit. Revelation refers to John being in spirit four times in total. Here, in chapter 1 at Patmos, in heaven in chapter 4, in the wilderness in 17, and finally on the mountain of God in 21. This loud voice introduces Jesus. He's instructed to write what he sees and send it to these seven churches. Here's our first significant seven. Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Philadelphia and Laodicea. He then gives us a very symbolic description of Jesus standing there before him, standing amongst these seven golden lampstands. He's clothed with a long robe. Long robes signify royalty or priestly. This denotes his righteousness, his honour. He has a golden sash across his chest. Sometimes we hear this described as a breastplate. He's ready to do the work of the Redeemer. His hair is described as as white as snow. Purity, without decay, our Jesus has not aged. His eyes are like the flame of a fire, piercing, penetrating his enemies. His feet, steady, they're like burnished bronze, strong and steadfast, unwavering strength and power. His voice is like the sound of many rivers, like a mighty river being fed by many small. 
the sound of power is heard from afar. In his right hand, he holds seven stars. Later, he tells us these are seven angels. From his mouth is a double-edged sword. His words can wound, but they can also heal. His face, so bright, it's shining like the sun and his full strength. His brightness is too strong for mortal eyes. It's dazzling, blinding. John falls at the feet of Jesus. The impression and the appearance of Jesus before him is too much. He's overpowered by this glory and he falls at his feet. But Jesus, the hand of reassurance, stretches out and places his hand on him. He gives him strength. Do not be afraid, he says. This is something we hear from angels, isn't it? He clearly describes to John to reassure him exactly who he is. He was dead and now he's alive forever. His crucifixion and his resurrection. He has conquered death. He has a key to death and Hades. He can open the gates not only to heaven, but to hell as well. So John is instructed to write, to write what he has seen. He will be instructed 11 more times in Revelation to write. He is to write to these seven churches. Again, we hear another seven, the number of completeness. His instructions is to the complete church, to all of us. Interestingly, Paul also wrote to seven churches, although they were not the same seven. Then, as if to help John, and to help us all, he explains the mystery of the seven stars and that of the seven lampstands. The seven stars are angels, but not just any angels. They are the angels of those seven churches. The seven lampstands that he stands amongst these are the seven churches. Jesus stands there amongst the seven churches. They surround him. He is at the center. And in his hand, he holds the seven angels of these seven churches. The guiders of these churches. The guiders are guided. They are held and protected by him. The glory of a power, wonderful, death-defying Jesus stands there amongst us. He is in the center of us all. He's always with us. He never leaves us. He stands there amongst us. A symbol is something we must not forget. He's always there for us. But, like John, we must turn around to see where that voice is coming from. We must turn around to see our Jesus. Thank you, Sarah. We are now going to sing. We're going to sing along to a video. Um, now, I think, are the words up on the screen? Will the words go up on the screen, Stan? Yes. The Old Rugged Cross. Uh, I mean, it's a good sing, this one, to start with. Uh, it's John Montgomery's version of The Old Rugged Cross. So we'll wait until the music...
and exchange it someday for a crown in the old rugged cross stained with love so divine a wondrous beauty I see for it was on that cross Jesus suffered and died to pardon and sanctify me so I'll cherish the old rugged cross till my trophies at last I lay down I will cling to the old rugged cross and exchange it someday for a crown to the old rugged cross I will ever be true its shame and reproach gladly bear then he will call me one day in his light I will stay at his glory forever So I'll cherish that old rugged cross Till my trophies at last I lay down And I will cling to the old rugged cross And exchange it someday for a Let us pray. Lord Jesus Christ, by the power of your presence, open the mind of God to us, that in your light we may see light, and in your strength be strong. Amen. Who doesn't like to receive a letter? A letter from a friend. Who doesn't like that? I love it. Trouble connecting to the internet. Check your Wi-Fi network. Thank you, Alexa. We didn't need to know that. I'm having trouble connecting to the internet. Check your Wi-Fi network connection. Okay. That will do. Just, you'll have to give me a little minute while I uh, turn it on. Be off. There we are. Uh, so I was talking about receiving a letter, which is quite amusing since Alexa then has just given me a marvellous... I'm having trouble connecting to the internet. And I'm having internet. trouble... Check your Wi-Fi network connection. You know, We're going to set it. I think this is a time where paper is required. <coughs> So we're talking about letters and whether we like receiving them or not. I love it. When amongst all the bank statements and the credit card bills that come through my letterbox, I discover a card or a letter from a friend, from wherever. It's a hangover, isn't it, from the pre-internet days, that excitement. When, as a student, I was at university something like 400 miles away from my family, and the weekly letters I exchanged with my mother were eagerly awaited to bring news and yes, I did get occasional letters from my father too, but unlike the ray of hope that spotting a letter from my mother gave me, the receipt from one of my father's rare letters raised a little jab of anxiety within me about various things. I don't know whether you've felt that feeling or not. The idea of hope and anxiety, two sides of living, aren't they? In whatever form you receive it, and it's true, as we read the book of Revelation 2, that's what we have. The anxiety and hope of life is laid out. But it's with a slant that urges us to consider the hope of the eternal future. And how does John tell us of his hope? It is one long letter from God to us, to all of us, to the churches. And Revelation is certainly an odd book, but it is basically about the ever-present God 
the God of the past, the God of the present, and the God of the future. The hope that the eternal God holds out to us every day, wherever we are, something really to grasp hold of. And then what happens? John writes a letter for us, dictated from an angel who in turn got the words from Jesus, who is telling us God's view of how the future world works at the moment and how he hopes it will work when we listen deeply to him. Do not be afraid, John writes. Do not be afraid. Jesus is the first and the last. Do not be afraid. The God of the past, present and future. And as we read John's words from Jesus, we discover that the Revelation is actually a very noisy book. Very noisy book. And back in my, it's a bit of a, ta- uh, going off on a bit of a tangent here, but back in my 20s and 30s, I played the French horn in any local amateur operatics musical society that would have me, that would put on around the northwest of England. This is a bit of a digression, a digression, but a word of advice. If you're ever asked by anyone which brass instrument a family member should pick up and try, I would suggest you think very carefully before you suggest they try the horn. The reason is simple. Most people will say it's quite a difficult instrument to play, and it is. But for me, if you end up playing in amateur orchestra pitch, you'll discover that the large amounts of the scores, the music you're playing, doesn't require most of the brass department. They get to get up and go partway through and spend time in the bar, but not the two horns. They will sit for 20 minutes playing long, sustained notes, often at uncomfortably high pitches, and watch their colleagues return for the loud, showy, show-off blowout at the end of the finale that everybody remembers. So think about your musical instrument choice if you're thinking about a brass instrument. But the Book of Revelation is full of loud noise and full of brass instruments, full of trumpets. They appear, they blow a loud note at important points and then they go silent. And we heard one today. We heard a loud blast on the trumpet. And later there's going to be more trumpets. There's going to be, let me think, seven trumpets. There's going to be clanging bowls, there's going to be beasts, there's thunder and a lot more noise. It turns out that the book of Revelation is a very noisy book. But a very noisy book of hope. But before we get to all that, John is asked to write letters to the seven churches of Asia. Seven. Sarah has told us about the number of seven a number of times. It's a special number, the number of completeness. Creation took seven days, a complete week. So these letters are written not just to the churches that they're addressed to, but to the whole church, the complete church. And each one follows a similar pattern. First we hear how familiar God is with the work of the church. He's there with them, he's watching, he knows what's happening. This is, after all, the God of the present that we are listening to. I know, he says, that you don't tolerate people who do not respect and help others out. I know that. I also know that you've been very patient and you've not given up on waiting for me. I know that. These are addressed to all the churches. These are addressed to us. But I have to say to you, says God, that I no longer see the spark of excitement in your eye as you go about your work as my church. He's just reminding them to take stock to look back at how things were or how things felt, maybe not the way they were doing it, and to change any things if you need to change, if you discover you need to change them to get that excitement back. Do this thinking so that you can recapture and show to the world the excitement that there is of following God, the excitement that once streamed from you into the world. Let everyone who can listen to what I'm saying to the complete church, the seven churches, the complete church, listen closely, because I hold out to you a great hope to grasp. This is the point that we hear in these letters. Remember the story of Eden in Genesis, the garden that held two trees, right back in Genesis 3, One was the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and we know that's the one that Adam and Eve ate from 
and God was not pleased and sent them off into the world and he placed a flaming sword to guard the way to the other tree, the tree of life. The tree of life. And this is the tree that allows you to live forever in the story. Well, that is the hope that God is offering. That's what he's saying here. I am the God of the past, the present, and the future. The tree of life is a permanent fixture in the future, in the new heaven and the new earth. Follow me as you once did, and I will give you permission to eat from the tree of life. I will give you permission. The threefold God of eternity offers us hope if we look back and review what we see with, with the God of the present and discover our needs to take forward in hope as we build the future of the church. It's about thinking about things. It's about reviewing things. God points out what he's seeing. And when I say the word church to you here today, I just wonder what do you think. I wonder what picture actually just pops into your mind. And I'm sure that you may all think of very different ideas about church, what's important to church to you. You might think of the same activities of church. We all might have the same ideas of what church is, but we might put them in a different order in a list of priorities. For most, if not all, it will be singing at Sunday worship. I hear that, I've heard that time and time again over the last, well, just over a year. Singing at Sunday worship is very important to us all. And gathering to chat, either in church before or with tea and coffee after, very important aspects of church for everyone. For others, it might be hear the Bible re read. We all like to hear the Bible read. And some people, and I think all of you do, you just maybe don't admit it, a little nugget taken away to think about during the week. Even if that is, I'm glad that the pew cushions are back today, it's not quite so hard. It might be, perhaps, how worship has changed over the years, not just in the style of hymns sung, and I don't just mean the digital uh, online services that we do, things like, maybe you remember how in years past, when you came through the doors, you were expected just to sit with your own thoughts about God, you weren't supposed to get up and wander around and talk to people and things like that. We're much, much more flexible or informal now, aren't we? The increase in the laughter and the chatter before a service. Or in the way that we can stream services live wherever we want in the world, which gives people a flexibility about when, when they watch it and where they watch it and, and what they're doing while they watch it, which is all to be welcomed. And maybe you'd be surprised because I was. Maybe you'll be surprised that on a normal week we get over 150 people viewing our service. Now that's a lot lower than other churches I know, but compared with what our Sunday congregation was before lockdown, that's, that is more than we regularly saw at worship in the East Church. And other thoughts might pool around the word church for you. It includes um, ways that we help others all the things that the church does for the community, those in need, whether through Tom Toms, the food bank, crafty church, or friendship lunch. And then again, maybe it's how we did come together to learn how to be a new kind of church over the lockdown period. Maybe it's how, before lockdown, a number of people involved with children's work took a long look at children's work and thought, well, hang on a minute, there's another way we can do it. And we had a few experiments, and it was going well, and then we had lockdowns, so and we had to stop it. But what we discovered during lockdown, through a webinar of the Church of Scotland, is that what we were doing, what we were starting to do, and what we intend to continue doing, was actually what ch other churches in the Church of Scotland were suggesting we do. We were, be we were what do they call it, in front of the curve. Let's put it that way. Um, it was very, very interesting to discover that. But even through lockdown, what else other people might think the church was, uh, is how we help each other. And we continue doing that during lockdown as well. How we give help throughout the world to, through Christian aid. And that was a bit of a challenge as well, since we're, Christian aid is so dependent on the little envelopes, finding ways of uh, bringing that to people's attention. But we do still do that. Or candy, the support we give to hand candy 
or the support here in Bankery through the food bank, but also through in giving individual time to a number, a small number of struggling families and parents who we've known for a wee while, and we support them. And most of that comes through Sarah's work as children and family worker, or our work for God in schools. Our new way of working with the schools involves a dozen, I think it's dozens of people, dozens of you, and not a, quite a large number of you, all again organised through Sarah, who help with a range of tasks in the school. Things changing, things that are important to the church, different things for different people, which is great because we've all got different skills and together we make the church work. What's coming to my mind, I don't think I mentioned crafty church or friendship lunch. All things are being part of the church. The crafty church has continued online and it's actually been very successful. So thank you, Charles. These are ways in which we follow Jesus. And I'm sure that just as Jesus commended the church at Ephesus for all they've been doing, the God of the present would ask us, as he commended us, he'd ask us, like he does the whole seven churches, to keep what we're doing under continual review, to keep what, how we do it under con continual review, as we listen to the Spirit and plan ahead with hope. And something you're going to hear much more about from the General Assembly over the next few months is the new Presbytery Mission Plan Act. I love the way that doing church in the Church of Scotland always ends up with the word act. Mission Plan Act, which requires presbyteries to plan mission in the same way we used to call a presbytery plan, but this is a kind of wider thing, plan within the bounds of the presbytery using five marks of mission. Now, I'm not going to mention them today, but you will hear much more about the five marks of mission that the General Assembly are encouraging us to look at in the coming months. Because each presbytery is required to produce and get approved a mission plan, which will describe how the presbytery is going to engage with what they call church mission in the following five years. And that includes how many ministers will be placed where, and how we will use our buildings, and how many charges will be working closely together and how they all might work. And when it comes to implementing the plan, and this is the bit I like about the plan, because I love flexibility, there is a quite a bit of flexibility of how we can organize ourselves, written into the rules. Unions, linkages, parish groupings, or team ministries. Now, all of these things have been around as ways of organizing the church for years. But now, as we get down to look at practical details, what we're finding is that it's, there's more flexibility in how we approach it than there was in previous years. And you may well be aware that we're already talking with Dramoak about how we can work more closely together. And John writes to the church at Ephesus, admiring that all they do, they do with patient endurance and perseverance. Patient endurance and perseverance. Two words for us, I think. It's a theme that appears seven times, oh, the number seven again, in the book of Revelation from chapter one to chapter 14. And if you're looking for a major Christian outlook to live by as a church, then this is it. Being church, hearing God's word, is not about just passively accepting things, as someone put it. That's the book of Revelation. This is not about sitting back and letting things happen. Patient endurance in the church is an active thing. Looking at things, seeing how we can change things a bit, or maybe we don't need to change things. Patience and endurance is an active obedience to the commandments of God and holding on to the faith that we profess in Jesus. Work we've carried on from those who came before us. We've reviewed what they did and maybe restructured it about a bit for what we want to do. And we work to prepare those coming after us to feel the hope that we have felt. And John will have more to say on this view of life later in the book, where we'll read of battles with beasts and Babylon, ways of life and animals that, if we accept them, would require us to compromise on faith, to embrace different views. And in fact, at one point in chapter 13, John speaks of a beast appearing from the sea. He says, we will need the endurance of a saint 
to survive. And if you persevere in this hope and God says he will give you permission to eat from the tree of life. Marvellous. This hope is a very stable type. It's, if you like, the entrance to the promised land where there are 12 different fruits every month to feed you and your friends. Everyone. But first, our job is to work with the God of the past, the present and the future by putting on our listening ears and following Jesus' leadership. Jesus shares our life for eternity. And here today on Communion Sunday, Jesus comes to us through the mystery of bread and wine to reinforce God's involvement in our lives by lifting us up to be nearer God as we give thanks for the love that he has shown us shown us through Jesus and the fruits of the Spirit. So, loving God, we ask now that you show us to use the gifts you've given us wisely and in the manner you expect. And now to God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, be glory and honour as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. At this point, as always, we'll stop, we'll pause for a bit of reflection while Douglas will bring the offering down. And uh, today the offering song is Be Still. Uh, that'll be a video. I think the words, the words will be up, so feel free to sing along behind your masks to Be Still. And Douglas will bring the offering forward.
So as if this were the only time and this the only place and we the only people, Jesus Christ will meet us. This is the table not of the church but of the Lord. It is to be made ready for those who love him and who want to love him more. So come, you who have much faith and you who have little, you who have tried to follow and you who have failed, come not because it is I who invite you, it is Jesus our Lord. It is his will that those who want him should meet him here. We sing our hymn, we'll sing along to, uh, to Jennifer singing, it's Jennifer Muriel, communion hymn is, I come with joy, a child of God. Now let us hear the story of how this sacrament began. <clears throat> Among friends gathered around a table, Jesus took bread, and having given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. After supper, he did the same thing with the cup, saying, this cup is my blood, my new covenant with you. Each time you drink this cup, do so in remembrance of me. What you must solemnly realize is that every time you eat this bread, and every time you drink this cup, you reenact in your words and actions the death of the Lord. You will be drawn back to this meal again and again until the Lord returns. So now, following Jesus, we do, we take this bread and this wine, the ordinary things of the world through which God will bless us. And as Jesus <clears throat> offered thanks for the gifts of the earth, let us also celebrate God's goodness. Let us pray. The Lord be with you and also with you. Lift up your hearts, we lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God, for it is right to give our thanks and praise. It's right because you've made us, loving God, and before us you made the world around us, and before the world you made the eternal home in which through Christ we have a place. And in this place where prayer has been made for many years, 
in this place where so many different people have found their common bond in your call and purpose, in this place where the walls are waiting to echo your praise, we wait. And with the church throughout the world, with the church on the other side of time, with those who once praised you here and have now have joined the closer harmony of heaven, we proclaim your greatness and we sing your praises. And grateful as we are for the world around us, the world we know and the universe beyond our ken, we particularly praise you, whom eternity cannot contain, for coming to earth, for entering time in Jesus, for Jesus' life which informs our living, for his compassion which changes our hearts, for his clear speaking, for his disturbing presence, his innocent suffering, his fearless dying, his rising to life, breathing forgiveness. We praise you and worship you. So here too, our gratitude rises for the promise of the Holy Spirit. So send down your Holy Spirit to bless us, to confront us with your claims and attract us to your goodness and call us, reminding us with glimpses of grace at unexpected moments through life that you have kept a place for us. And bless these your gifts of bread and wine, that the bread which we break may be for us the communion of the body of Christ, and the cup of blessing which we bless may be for us the communion of the blood of Christ, that we receiving them by faith may be made partakers of his body and blood with all his benefits to nourish us and help us grow in grace to the glory of your most holy name, and here we offer and present to you ourselves to be a living sacrifice, dedicated and fit for your acceptance through Jesus Christ our Lord. And loving God, as we are gathered round this table at this special time, we offer in a moment of silence, of quietness, our own prayers to you for all that concern us about the world and all those people who lie heavy on our hearts today for whatever reason. So remember, O oh Lord, your church, our families and friends, all those who are sick or suffer pain or loneliness, all those who draw near to death, and those we have named in our hearts before you. Comfort them with your presence. Sustain them by your promises. Grant them hope and grant them your peace through Jesus Christ, our Lord. In the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honour and glory are yours, almighty Father, now and forever. And so hear us as we continue to pray in the words that your son Jesus taught us to say together. We say, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial, and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Among friends gathered round the table, Jesus took bread and broke it, and said, This is my body, it is broken for you. And later he took the cup of wine and said, This is the new relationship with God, made possible because of my death. Take this, all of you, in remembrance of me. Jesus, Lamb of God, have mercy on us. Jesus, bearer of our sins, have mercy on us. Jesus, redeemer of the world, grant us peace. So now we draw near with faith to receive the body of our Lord Jesus Christ. And we're going to do it today. We're going to take communion together. So the three of us up here will take communion and at the same time we'll invite you to take the bread first from the pot and then to drink the wine when we drink the wine from the cups. So we receive the body of our Lord Jesus Christ given for us. We receive his blood which was shed for us 
and we feed on him in our hearts by faith with thanksgiving for happy are those who find refuge in him so let us take and eat together this is the body of christ which is for us we do this in remembrance of him by Christ's blood, which was shed, shed that the sins of many might be forgiven, and together we drink from the cup. things of God for the people of God. The peace of God be with you. Now we can't share the peace as we normally would but if you would just like again to turn to somebody and either smile quietly behind your mask or wave, just wave the peace across. A nice ripple of peace. The peace be with you. Mate. <laughs> we are learning new skills aren't we? Let us pray. Loving God, in gratitude, in deep gratitude for this moment, we give ourselves to you. You have made us one with all your people, in heaven and on earth. You have fed us with the bread of life and renewed us for your service. And so we ask that our daily living may be part of the life of your kingdom, and that our love may be your love, reaching out into the life of the world, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Our concluding hymn this morning is two verses of, that's verses one and three, if you know it all off by heart, of um, Look Forward and With Faith. We'll be singing again to the, to the music uh, that Jennifer and uh, Muriel have produced.
down and then he'll come back and operate the door in only the way that David can do it. <laughs> Forgot to put that back on. I'll take, we have to take each one, we'll just take each one. Okay. 